morning, church. God is always on the move. He's always doing things we don't even realize. I didn't realize that while we were praising and worshiping, I was just told that someone this morning has already rededicated their life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Anybody want to celebrate that? In the middle of praise and worship. God doesn't always operate according to our plans, but He is on the move. And the title of today's message is Any Day Now. And and oftentimes we use that phrase in kind of anxiousness, aggravation, right? (sighs) Things happen when you become a parent. It definitely changes you a lot. And one of the things that I find myself sometimes thinking is, I have to sound a lot like my dad. (laughs) My, My boy Lincoln is... He has one speed, generally, and that's full tilt. You know, actually, if you put him on a four-wheeler, it's pedal to the metal, you know. And that's how he lives until the phrase comes, it's time to go. (laughs) It's time to leave or it's, it's time to go to bed. When you say the words, it's time, he goes from full tilt to a screeching halt. And it's all of a sudden, you know, I, well, Dad, you know, it's, I know it's time to go to school, but I don't have any snacks in my backpack. Or you get to the door, and it's, well, I don't like those shoes. So we got to go clear up to the bedroom, get in the closet, get out the pair of shoes that he likes, get back to the door and realize that he forgot his jacket. So then we need to go back to the bedroom. After we take his shoes off, go get the jacket, come back, put the shoes back on. And the whole time I'm thinking, any day now, Lincoln... If you go any slower, we're going to be moving backwards. Time will be going in reverse here. And and, and we all all get there, don't we, at times. We all get frustrated uh, about time. See, are there situations or maybe a storm in your life right now that you've just been thinking, any day now this could end? I'm ready for this to be over. Anybody here ready for some situations, some storms in your life to come to an end? It's had its beginning, it's had its time, and it's about time for it to stop. Amen? And I think the word God wants to bring is that for us to go from the frustration of any day now to us saying in faith, any day now, this is done. Any day now. The end of this storm is coming, and it's coming quick. See, in the Scriptures, this is something, I I just have to say this. And some of this this morning, I'm going to have to be very real, and I I pray right now that if you came this morning with your church face, your church mask, and if you know what I mean, you know, the whole I'm happy, perfect thing, please take it off at this moment. Because the remainder of the service, we need to be real. Amen? The enemy wants you to think that you're not worth much. And if he can do that, he can make you think that maybe God is the one that's holding up progress. Because God wouldn't want you to progress because you're not worth much. You're just a big mess. But the scriptures describe you this way. It talks about a, a merchant ship, and the merchant was a sailor who went around the world searching for the greatest pearls. And he found one pearl. He'd been looking for many, but he found one. And it was so important to him, he went and sold everything he had. And his name is Jesus. And the one pearl that made him give everything he had, that's his life on the cross, was you. It's hard for us to understand, but he did not die for you out of pity. He believed you were worth it. You're the pearl of great price that the Son of God thought, I'll give everything I have for that one, for her, for him. He goes on to say it's like a a man who was walking through a field and he found a great treasure. 
<laughs> and he looked at it, and he went and he hid the treasure so no one else would find it. And he went and he sold everything he had. But it says he went with joy to sell everything. The scriptures say, for the joy that was before him, Jesus endured the cross. Relationship with you, having you brought him such joy that he had to go to the cross. You're worth that to him. Amen? Because you've been created in his image and likeness. Of The pinnacle of his creation is you. You can think, you can plan, you can reason, you can love. You are the reflection of God. You are of such incredible value that he went to the ends of the world to get you and to buy you and to keep you. See, you have such value. See, I can, if I want to build a building, I can throw up a shack in a day. But it's not worth much. It's not of much value. See, to build a beautiful home, to build something of great value takes great effort and time. Things in your life are taking time, not because God doesn't love you or doesn't think anything of you. It's just the opposite. He's building something wonderful. I want to read a passage, this first passage to you out of Isaiah 54. Oh, you afflicted one. You have been going through the storm for a long time, tossed. See the storm waters? Tossed with tempest and not comforted. You don't understand what's going on. You don't know why. You're saying, any day now, God, get me out of this. I can't take it. But what is God doing? So notice this. Behold, this is God speaking. I will lay your stones with beautiful gems. See, the Bible says you are a living stone in 2 Peter 2, 5. He says you are living stones being built up a spiritual house. But what kind of stones are you? He says, I'll lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. You're not any old shack. He's making you into a beautiful palace. Hallelujah. It's going to take some time. He says, I'll make your pinnacles of rubies and your gates of crystal and all your walls of precious stones. See, God is on the move, church. But he's not making you just in any old thing. He's making you into a beautiful thing. And those things take time, they take effort, they take a willingness. And the thing we need to realize is this, is that the Father has made us business partners. And this is the reason. If you're not a partner, you can't have what's His. So the heart of the Father says, come on board with my plan. I'm making you into something amazing you can't even imagine. But I want your partnership. See, when I was a kid, I would get aggravated, thought I was waiting on my parents. And as children of God, we tend to be that way. But the fact of the matter is, our parents see where we're headed, how to develop us, and they're actually the ones saying, any day now. Any day now. Is this good, church? See, if we're going to be built up into this thing that he's making us, we've got to come on board with him. Jude chapter 1 verse 20 says, But you, beloved, notice this phrase, building yourselves up. Notice it doesn't say God building you up. It says you building yourselves up. Because he's brought you into partnership in his business. Huh? Is this good? Is this, is this going on over? Because I can say it again if you still haven't caught it. He says, building yourselves up on what? Your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. See, when we're saying any day now, God, you can solve this, he's saying it right back, any day now. <laughs> I'm just waiting for you to start building. I'm waiting for you to start praying in the Holy Spirit. I've, huh, that's why he gives us a prayer language, by the way. Don't be afraid of it. Dive on into it. Huh. See, so often we get, in, we get in a hurry, and it's kind of like if you plant a fruit tree and you, and you see finally some buds and you see some fruit, but we, we get anxious and we want to run out there and pick the fruit while it's still not ripe. And when you do that, you kill the fruit and you hurt the tree. 
See, God's doing something amazing, but we don't need to be anxious with Him. We just need to get on board with what He's doing. <laughs> this morning, God's bringing you through your storm. But the thing is this, you are going to become a storm-proof person. Because, see, the enemy can still cause storms once you get through this storm. And if you don't learn how to handle storms in this storm, the next one will shake you. But God is making you so strong that you won't be shaking when the shaking strikes again. There's three building blocks we want to talk about this morning that we work with God in building. We are in His business so we can grow and move forward past the current situation that we're in. Is this good? Remember what he said, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. The first building block is, number one, to build faith. Build your faith. How do we do that? What did he say? Praying. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Building yourselves up. There's something about prayer that makes everything change. Philippians 4, 6, he says... Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. But notice this next phrase, in what? Everything. Turn to your neighbor and say, it means everything. When he says everything, he means pray about everything. Everything by prayer and supplication. With what? With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I want to say something to you. You're so focused on your situation that it's hindering your prayer life. Because all you're thinking about, all you're praying about, is the one thing. When he says, in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. What happens is this. See, God is doing a lot of stuff for you even when you don't ask him. I don't, my boys don't have to come and beg me to give them three square meals. I, ju I just do it anyways. In fact, most of the time, they don't even seem thankful. Half the time, they complain about what they got to eat. They, they want something else. They leave that food laying there, and five minutes later, I'm hungry. <laughs> See, God is so good, He's doing all this stuff for you that you're not asking Him for. The problem is, is because we're not asking, we're not realizing that He's the one doing it. And so we're not realizing that he's doing all this stuff. But what happens when you start praying about everything is you start to see all these answered prayers. And you start to connect with God's doing this. He's providing me in this way. He's given me this person in my life. He's solving this situation. He guided me in that situation. He's meeting all these daily needs. Look at all that God is doing. And all of a sudden, your focus has gotten off the one thing and you're seeing all these answered prayers. And guess what happens when you see answered prayers? What's getting built up? Your faith. Because you're saying, whoa, God is on the move. The enemy had me fixed on the one problem when God's solving all these things. And if he's solving all this, he's got my storm handled. Is that good, church? Hallelujah, you don't need to spin one plate. Spin 50 and watch them spin and watch God answer. Hallelujah. You watch and you begin to see what God is doing and connect with what He's up to. Romans 12, 12 says rejoicing in hope. I want you to see something here. Hope, rejoicing is a choice. I choose in the midst of the storm to rejoice. What's happening? I'm getting stronger. Patient in tribulation. You know what that, I could translate it this way. Being brave in your trial. Being brave in your trial. Patient through your tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in what? Prayer. That word continuing steadfastly, you phrase comes together, it just means being completely devoted. I'm not going to stop praising Him. I'm not going to stop seeking Him. I'm not going to stop praying, I'm going to keep pressing on through because God's got it. Amen? 
See, what's happening is this is changing us. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice how often, church? How often? Pray how often? Without ceasing. Oh, and then notice what it says next. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The storm comes and I keep praying. The storm comes and I keep praising. The storm comes and I keep rejoicing. God's got it. He's taken care of it. Hallelujah. He's the one in control of everything. He's the one that has all authority in heaven and earth. See, what's happened is, is I'm growing as I'm walking by faith. The enemy's making a big mistake. He doesn't rush. See, pearls are formed in the clam as, as through pressure and friction. And it takes time, but that pressure and that squeezing and that friction is forming something beautiful. And the enemy doesn't understand that by bringing trials and affliction, what it's doing is God's like, devil, you're on a short leash. You're just a tool, is what God's saying to the enemy. Because you don't realize that my child is coming out double strong. Is this, is this not as good as I think it is? I, I mean, this word. See, it, these answers come and, and they build our faith. Because we see them. But the question is, how many of y'all, if we all had our way, we'd get the answer to every prayer right now, wouldn't we? I mean, that's just the way the world would operate it according to us. But see, when the answer doesn't come immediately, it's because he's not just building your faith, he's building your character. Because you're getting stronger through a delayed answer. You're not only getting your faith built now, your whole character is rising. The next building block this morning is to build character. <coughs> build character. Look in James chapter 1, verse 2. James 1, verse 2. My brethren, that's you and I, count it all joy. Notice it's not when you just have a trial, but when you have various trials. How can you do that? The word count is a word speaking of how you perceive of things. See, when we're all fretting and worrying, we're seeing things just the way the enemy wants us to. God has the universe in his hand. The devil caused one little storm in one person's life. And somehow we think the little devil causing one storm is anywhere near the one who's holding everything in the palm of his hand. Hallelujah. <laughs> Count it all joy. Realize who's on the throne. Realize the one who has authority over the storm, over the trial. He's utterly in control. Not the enemy. And the enemy is on such a short leash, he doesn't even realize it. When God wants to yank that choker collar, it's over. Are you hearing me? Count it all joy. Because you know what? You realize... Man, God's up to something. I'm getting ready to go to the next level. Because notice what the next thing says. Verse 3, knowing. Once again, this has to do with your perception. Realizing, I could say it that way, that the testing of your faith is producing what? Patience. And the word patience, actually, it means to be able to endure for a long time. What, what's happening here? You are getting the ability, listen, to never quit. You're becoming the kind of person that has a kind of tenacity. You just never stop. Are you hearing me? Notice this next phrase. And this is what I said, how we want all our answers quick. Notice this. This is good, church. But let patience have its perfect work. We as parents sometimes want to scoop in and rescue our children from friction in their life. But sometimes they need a little friction because they're growing through it. And if we always helicopter over our kids and never let them go through anything, experience any pain, any hardship, they're not going to be a strong person. God, loving Father, knows when to pull back. 
Because he says, you know what? I'm still watching over them. They're okay. But I see what's happening in this. They're becoming untouchable. Because notice what it says next. This is so good, but let patience have its perfect work. Notice this, that you may be what? And, And that doesn't mean you're flawless. It means you've reached your potential. I believe these pews are full of people who have the Holy Spirit inside of them. They have the seed of Almighty God, His DNA planted in their hearts. They have unlimited potential that hasn't been tapped by the church. There is more potential in this building than in Washington, D.C. Amen? Hollywood, everything combined. Can't even touch the power that is. But listen, it's been pent up because we haven't been building. We haven't become co-laborers with Christ, as Paul described it. Is this good? That you may be perfect and complete. Notice this next phrase. Lacking how much? Nothing. In other words, you, stay in the, you say in the middle of the storm, I've got everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Amen? Amen, Amen church. Amen. You have everything you need. You can reach your full potential where even in the middle of the storm, you know it's okay. You know God's got it. <sighs> Because he's brought you to that kind of place where you can rejoice. Because you know who's on the throne. You know who lives in your heart. You know how the story ends. Have you read the end of the book? It's not going to change. We still win. It doesn't matter what the enemy does, what he tries, what tricks he pulls. He still loses. Hallelujah. You still win. The thing is, I don't want you to just win in the end. You have the victory now. This gospel about how this was just making a few more weary days and then one day I'll get out of here is not the gospel. The gospel says you have the victory. The greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Some of you ought to be shouting right now. That's what this is all about, church. I'm not only going through this, I'm getting better. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly, above and all that we ask, that's my prayer life, or think. That's even my thought life. I I can even imagine. According to the power that's doing what? Working in us. That's what God's up to. Notice how Paul phrased the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4. He says, I have fought the what? The good fight. It's a fight, church, but it's a good fight. We win. Amen. Let me put it this way. Paul said, I went through my trials. He didn't say, I've had an easy life. He said, I've went through my storms. I fought the what? The good fight. Why is it a good fight? Because he realized he could count it all joy. Because every single time the devil started to move, it meant God was about ready to promote him. He was about ready to go to the next level. The enemy was about ready to mess up again. The devil is a bad card player. He always overplays his hand. (laughs) Did you hear that? He always goes a step too far. And it always blows back in his face. Why else would he have allowed Jesus to go to the cross? Did you hear that? He always overplays his hand. Notice this next phrase, I have finished the race. When we said that you might be perfect, complete, lacking nothing, the same word is translated here as finished. He said, in other words, I've reached my potential. I've fulfilled the call of God on my life. I have kept the faith. This is better than some of you are looking. You're not looking back at me like I think you should be. Some of you are. Some of you aren't. Verse 8, he says, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. That day we win. And not to me only, but for you, church. Also to all who have loved his appearing. Jesus is coming back. Amen. It's the blessed hope of the church. 
See, what is, what is God up to? He's giving you answers when you begin to pray about everything that your faith is just growing by leaps and bounds. But there's some things in your life that the answers stay delayed. Why? Because He's making you stronger through that. He's not just building faith now. He's making you stronger in character. He's make, bringing you to the point not only where you can come through the storm, but that the storms don't even shake you anymore. But there's some answers, listen, that seem to take forever. See, there's, there's things that we go through that take part of a day. Some things will go through a week. Some things go on for months. Then we have the things that go on for years. And the amazing thing about this is that when God, when you put money on the bank, especially back when the interest rates were better, yeah. not now, what happened to that money as it sat there? It grew. Delayed answer prayer is only delaying because it's building interest. The reward's too good to give it to you right now because it would spoil it. It's like you, you're begging God for an apple and he says, wait till tomorrow and I'll give you a thousand. That's the last thing we need to build, church. We need to start building interest. See, there's amazing reward in this life and how many of y'all know the greatest reward isn't in this world? Exactly. Build interest. I want to look at one long passage here because it's worth looking at. Luke chapter 19. Is this worth our time, church? I want us to learn how to build interest. Luke 19, verse 11. Now as they heard these things, he, this is Jesus, spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem. And notice this, because they thought the kingdom of God would, would appear when? Immediately. Any day now, God. They're anxious. And he's saying, no, it's not going to work that way. It is going to appear, but there's going to be some things that happen in the meantime. This parable is how to live in the period between Jesus' first coming and him coming back. Where we are right now. And I believe we're closer than ever to the second side. Amen? It says, Therefore he said, A certain nobleman, that's himself, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Right now he's in heaven, right? He's going to come back. He's going to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas. By the way, a mina is a coin that would have been worth about three months' salary. So it's several thousand dollars. Um, and it says, and he said to them, Notice this phrase, Do business. Till I come. Is God in the business of building people? Who is, he, uh, who is he offering business partnership to? That's what we've been talking about the whole time, amen? Building faith, building character, building interest. He's saying, you guys do business while I'm away. I like the old King James that says, occupy. Occupy. Hallelujah. It, it, it means to invest the money I gave you. Invest your mana and make it multiply. Amen? Amen? Yeah. He says, I'm investing this in you, and I want you to take what I've put in you, and I want you to multiply it. I want you to invest it. I want you to occupy. But notice how the world reacts, verse 14, but his citizens hated him. Isn't so much of the world angry at God fighting God? And they sent a delegation after him saying, we'll not have this man reign over us. In other words, so many people have rejected Christ. Hallelujah, but he's still king anyways, isn't he? And it says in verse 15, And so it was that when he returned, when Jesus comes back, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to know whom he had given the money to be called to him. Notice this next phrase, that he might know how much every man had gained by his trading. God has deposited His Spirit. He's deposited His power, His authority in you. And you know what He's saying? When I come back, they're going to have used it and they're going to have a lot more of it. Huh. And so in verse 16, then came the first saying, Master, your mana, that one mana has earned me ten. And, and Jesus says to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful with just very little. See, we, might, we may not feel like much, we may not feel like we have much to offer, but that little bit with God can become a mighty, mighty work. Amen? 
That little bit, that little seed has such potential. That seed of God in you can become something extraordinary. Amen? It has limitless potential. He says, I, he says you've been faithful with very little. Have authority over what? Ten cities. That's no small reward, is it? One minor turns to ten, and he says, you know what? I'm going to give you rulership. I want you to occupy. Amen? I want you to be part of my business. And it says, and the second came, saying, Master, your minors earned me five minors. Likewise, he said to him, you shall also be over five cities. Wow. But then the third one, another one came, Master, here's your mina. He gives it back to him. It's the same potential God had placed in him. He just hands that potential back. It's kind of like if you know your scriptures, Esau, when he sold his birthright. He had no respect for it. And he says, Master, here's your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. It's interesting. He hasn't been one of the group that hated the Lord and rebelled. He's just done nothing. He's lived his life in neutral coasting. Why? Because I feared you. And the kind of fear he's talking about is, I don't trust you. I think you're a bad boss. I don't like working with you. And notice what he accuses God of. Because you're an austere, that means severe man. You're too hard. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. In other words, God places potential within us and then expects us to work to Him to reach that potential. Are you following me? All the while the world's screaming, God, where are you? He's saying, I'm waiting on you. Come on. All the while we're screaming, any day now, God. He's saying, I know, any day now. I've given you everything you need for life and godliness. 1 Peter 1, 2 Peter. I've given you everything you need. And notice what, how he responds. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. You understood that I had expectations for your life. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with what? Interest. He's wanting us to build interest. Have we been good business partners? Could this be why nobody preaches this? See, I could come in here this morning and all this excites me. And I hope it excites you. But at the same time, I think a lot of pastors avoid it because it also is an exciting conviction. It's an exciting challenge. You see, the, the excitement comes with the... And he's asking me to do something. Yeah. He's building interest in your life. That's why some things don't come quick. That's why some things seem to take forever. Because it's way too good for him to give it to you all at once. In verse 24, and he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him, the one who hid it, and give it to him who has ten minas. I want you all to be ten minor people. Because notice what happens. But they said to him, Master, he already has ten. See, they don't think that's fair. If you're the fair police, and you think everything in life ought to be fair, you don't want to be part of God's business. Because he invests in good workers. Amen? He's a good God and he's smart. Because he knows you will take care of what he gives you. How many of y'all would take something you have, something precious, and hand it off to somebody you know is going to trash it? Abuse it? Misuse it? Not going to want to do that, are you? See, God, you're way too precious. His kingdom's way too precious. The souls of the lost are way too precious for him to just hand it off to everybody. He's building you into somebody he can trust with his kingdom. 
He says, for I say to you that everyone who has will be given. In other words, the one who stewards his interest is going to get so much back, it's in, he won't even be able to count his money. And I mean in the kingdom sense. But even who, notice the next phrase, even what he has, the next phrase, and from him who does not have. In other words, they won't steward it. They won't build interest. They just, they just won't trust God. He says even what he has will be taken away from him. In other words, that potential that's in there will never be reached. And he'll never be trusted with the true riches of the kingdom because he was never ready. I want to see a church of ready soldiers, of ready children. Because you have a father that owns everything. And he has invited you into his business, so it gives him the right to give you everything he's got. Is that good or what? That's who he is. This whole thing about God's not good or he's the one holding back, there is no greater lie in all the universe. He is the good one. He is the giver. He's the promoter. He's the blesser. He's the love. That's who he is. He can't help it. It's his, his nature. He couldn't change it because it's who he is. And he passionately pursues you. I don't care how far you've tried to run away. You won't get out of the place where his love doesn't exist. You won't find a place where the Father won't find you out. He's everywhere. And he's in a relentless pursuit of you in your heart. He won't stop chasing you. And he wants to bring you into his fold. He wants to shepherd you, grow you, father you. And he wants you to become everything he's made you to be. You're the pearl of great price. You're worth everything to him. He gave his own son so he could have you too. My boys, I love what I do here. I, I, love, I love my calling. The thing that I find more joy in and I have more fun, and my dad will test this, those boys are more fun to play with than anything you've probably ever done, aren't they? I mean, it's just, I mean, every once in a while they'll get, you know, but as a whole, it just, it is so, it's just a joy unspeakable. Because their, their play is so innocent. And their imagination, they haven't been taught you can't do that. Everything is possible. And why did Jesus say you must be converted and become as little children? In their world, everything is a possibility. If you think it, it can happen. This is what God says, I'll do stuff that you can't even think of. He does exceeding abundantly above what you can ask or think. Take the limits off God. Take them off. A little while back, I was playing with them. Uh, I want to invite the worship team forward. And we had a box down in the basement, a great big box. I don't remember what had come in it, but it's huge. And Lincoln and Colin crawl under that, and they love stories. They love to be read to. And we had been doing uh, the three pigs and the big bad wolf, you know. And, and they get underneath of that, and, and Lincoln's, Daddy, you're the wolf. And, and so, uh, you know, they get it within there, and, he, and I, he's like, our house is made of brick. You can't do anything about it, you know. It was, just, it was just so cool. Because, see, that story, if you remember, the, the three pigs are sent out into the world to, to reach their fortune, their mom tells them, to reach their potential. But the one's lazy, and he just builds a real quick house, cheap house out of straw. And we know what happens. And the second one, he's, he, he tries a little harder, but he still doesn't want to spend much time working. And so he just uses some old sticks and builds a house real quick. But the third one builds his house out of brick. And he ends up in the end, as you know, eating the big bad wolf. That's you. The enemy doesn't win, you do. That's you. Jesus has already defeated all principality and power. He's put it under his feet. Are you in Christ? 
then the big bad wolf's already under your feet. Amen. Jesus put it this way, the good shepherd, he said, if you'll just listen to what I say and do it. Nowadays, we, we dig a footer and we pour concrete in before we build a house, but they didn't have concrete at that time. And so they would, they would begin to dig. And at first, you would even get hit in loose rock, but you're not done. You, you got to dig through the loose rock. And sometimes that's hard to do. If you've ever done much digging, especially by hand, digging through hard ground is not fun. But what they were looking for was bedrock. And that might be a good ways down. But they would dig all the way till they reached that. And then they would lay their foundation all the way up because they knew that that was the most important thing, the foundation. And Jesus said, if you'll do that, if you'll found your life on the rock, and who's the rock? And what he's taught us, even here this morning, what's going to happen is you're going to be the kind of person that's dug deep to a rock that's immovable. It's unshakable. And what he said is then the storms came and the winds blew, but the house stood because it was built upon the rock. He's not just bringing you a place where he's going to take you through the storm. He's building you to the place where you are storm-proof. The devil can cause a hurricane of unending proportions. And guess what?